I am a child neurologist. There's no point in denying it. Um, it's a funny little specialty, and it's one label that I've carried with me now for more than half of my life. I got into child neurology in a sort of a funny way because it was a new specialty uh, as I was finishing medical school, and it sits at the interface between pediatrics and neurology. And some very smart people decided that those two should come together. And I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to be one of the first several hundred people in North America that went through the training and learned that particular discipline. So whenever I finished my training and I started my clinical work, uh, I was really excited because I thought, this is a new thing. This is a new field. We're bringing together what we know about pediatrics and what we know about brain science. Of course, in those days, what we knew was much less than now. Um, I was confident because I thought I had good training, and I sort of default to confidence, even sometimes when I shouldn't. Um, and I was optimistic, optimistic about the chance to really make a difference in the lives of the children and the families that I served. And then I met a patient. And that particular patient, I'm going to call him Jack. That was not his real name, and this is not his real picture. But he was a real boy. And this is the way I remember him. Beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed. Brought by his mother for concern about Jack's loss of developmental skills. The quote I've never forgotten over decades is the light went out of his eyes. They had had a vibrant, interactive, speaking, playful two-year-old. And over a period of months, he had withdrawn into his own shell. He was no longer speaking, playing with his sister, interested in toys, or reacting when they called his name. He sat in the corner, flipped his fingers like this, and ignored the world. Mother's question for me as a young child neurologist was, do you know what this is? Nobody else seems to know what this is. Secondly, what can you do about it? And third, what's going to happen to Jack? Well, I did know what it was called. It was called autistic regression, which in those days was thought to be a rare condition, which we now no longer believe is so rare. But it's a form of the autistic spectrum, which presents in children who have otherwise been doing well until between 12 and 24 months when they begin to lose their skills. I had no idea what caused it. I had no effective treatment to recommend, and I knew that the prognosis was very poor. So my ability to help Jack and his mother was limited to an expression of concern and willingness to be there and help them through the process when I had very few tools. Why was that such a terrible situation? Well, in those days, and now I'm talking about 30 plus years ago, in those days, we had no clue what caused autism. The definitions were very narrow, and the biological understanding about brain development was very limited. Because we didn't know what caused the condition, we really didn't have any treatments available, and the prognosis was very poor. So this was a life-changing situation for me. Here I was, with my confident optimism, trained by the best brains in child neurology, clueless how to help the child in front of me. Over the space of a year or two, I saw a number of other children with similar situations in which I came to the realization, causing me to come to the realization, that I had only learned half of what I needed to know. I knew how to diagnose, but I didn't know what was underneath the diagnosis in many cases, and I didn't have a lot of effective treatment to offer in almost all situations. So I began to look around, and I happened to be in a place where there were people who were not child neurologists, who came from other disciplines, other professions, developmental psychology, communication disorders, audiology, social work, social sciences. And I was able to engage in a research group in, that, in those days that was looking in a multidisciplinary fashion at what could be determined about brain function in children's development and what we could know about what was going wrong so we could try to be helpful. And so I was able to connect with this group, brilliant group of people, learn from them, and once again, I was excited. I thought, okay, here we go. Now, now we're gonna get there. I was confident. I thought, sure. 
these people are so smart, they come from so many different perspectives that they're going to nail this, and I'm going to get to be here when that happens. And I was optimistic. I thought, how long can this take? A few years, five years, may, maybe 10 at the outside, right? Yeah, well, I was wrong again. So what happened, because of that group and hundreds of other groups working in those days, I'm not talking about the 80s and early 90s, in terms of looking at developmental neuroscience, is that the biology of the newborn brain and children's brains began to become more understandable through technology, through neuroimaging, through these team sort of assessments where we could talk to each other about what we saw through our lens. We began to understand something, something about typical brain development. A newborn baby who's full term is born with 100 billion neurons. That's the operating unit of the brain. Each of those neurons has somewhere between 7 and 10 synapses or connections on it. That's a lot, right? But they're fairly short synapses, and they're not wired together. So we began to understand some things about the neurobiology, but that was, again, only half of the answer. The other half is that the only way an infant's brain begins to develop is by interacting with the world. And the world for infants is primarily their caretaker, their parents, and those that are close to them. And so in looking at the social science and the developmental psychology, tying that to developmental neuroscience, we, and whenever I say we, I don't mean a little group of people. I mean tens of thousands of people around the world who were interested and concerned about this, from the laboratory scientists to the classroom teachers began contributing to our understanding about the importance of reciprocal interaction. OK, so baby's brain comes into the world with a certain number of neurons that's under genetic control. That's all there kind of prenatally. If there's not a genetic glitch, it's going to be good. They get into a good environment. They have a loving, supportive, interactive family, and things are going to be good. Their brains get built. Their synapses multiply by the tens and hundreds so that over the first three years, a baby has 90% of the connections that they're going to have. Pretty impressive. The most synapses you ever had in your life is between the time you were three and four. So what a potential that was. I thought, OK, we got it, right? Again. But we had to take, collective we, had to take that information and apply it to neurodevelopmental conditions and disorders, autism, be one of the, autism being one of the leading ones. So over, I thought, five or 10 years, over 35 years, there has evolved a better understanding of the underpinnings of the biology of autism. When I say known causes, I fully accept the fact that we don't know the cause of every individual child's autism, but we know that collectively, the causes are genetically there for the vast majority. And we know that those genetic vulnerabilities may be new to the child, or they may be the accumulation of an inherited group of sub-threshold traits that exist within a family. Lots known about this now. We also know what doesn't cause autism. Bad parenting does not cause autism. Brain damage does not cause autism. Vaccinations do not cause autism. We have learned what risk factors are. What do you think is the most common risk factor for autism? A sibling with autism. If you have an older sibling with autism, your chance of getting autism is 20 times the norm. That's that genetic link. 80% 80, 80 of the time it doesn't happen. 20% of the time it does. We know prematurity is a risk factor. We know some prenatal medications are risk factors. We've learned a great deal. And in parallel, treatments have been developed. Once you begin to understand the underpinnings, the biology here, you begin to say, well, wait a minute. How can we take what we know about typical brain development and apply it to the brain of a child with autism? Guess what? Reciprocal interaction works. The child with autism comes into the world 
with the biological vulnerability and distortion of the connectivity of the brain. Intense environmental work with trained therapists, training parents, and all of the rest can change the brain circuit, can form positive synapses. I'm not saying it's a cure, but it's an effective treatment. We now know that there are more than 40 research-proven therapies for autism. More than 40. This is no longer not treatable. And of course, if we understand more and we treat more, the prognosis is better. So what's the problem? I should be dancing a happy dance. I ought to take a victory lap and go home. Well, first of all, there's another 30 years worth of stuff to learn, at least, in terms of the biology and the treatments and the genetic influences. But that's not the big problem. I don't expect people in this audience to help with that. Here's the reality. These are facts. The first signs of autism in the large majority of children diagnosed are evident between 12 and 18 months of age. On average, parents recognize differences in their children between 18 and 24 months of age. Call attention to those concerns to a variety of people that live around them and care for their children. And the average age of diagnosis in the United States, which is the lowest of anywhere in the world, is age four and a half. Well, all right, so we diagnose these kids before they're five, right? Yeah, not good. It's not good because the other biological fact is there are sensitive times and critical windows when brains are more responsive to treatment. And that's true in the developing brain. You know this. Let's say you're talking to your neighbor lady over the fence. She begins slurring her speech. She gets weak on the right side of her body. You think, oh my goodness, this lady's having a stroke. What do you do? You call 911. We have a culture of first responders. People who are there to deal with the reality that time matters. Therefore, call 911, EMTs come, administer initial therapy, transport the lady to get treatment, and if the treatment is initiated under six hours of age, about 30% of people have very modest disability following a major stroke. Huge change. Recognition, response, treatment. Okay. Am I making this up? I told you about Jack. I'll tell you about another child. This child right now is being cared for by my colleague at the Autism Center. This was a little boy named Sam, who was a vulnerable, high-risk baby born prematurely with complications. Parents were aware, tuned in. They saw that Sam was not developing appropriately along the expected trajectory. They sought help. They were aggressive about seeking help and kept asking for help until they got referred for a definitive evaluation at our center. My partner diagnosed him under the age of two. Sam was enrolled in an extremely intensive treatment model that exists in some places in this city and around the country, which spends many hours a week treating intently the child's variations in their development. When I was talking about the neurobiology earlier and the reciprocal interaction, I neglected to tell you one critical fact. That's the initiation of those responses is generated by the baby. The baby looks at mom. The baby says coo. The baby waves her arms. And parents react. One of the core de deficits in autism is the children don't send the message. They don't serve the tennis ball to get returned. One instance is no big deal. A thousand instances a week. 30,000 instances a month, a million instances a year, it changes synaptic development. So in Sam's case, the intense intervention was aimed at 
teaching Sam to initiate and to respond. We change the tennis match. The therapists that work with these children are messengers from God. They are amazing. Hours and hours and hours. And over years, they change these children. I saw Sam's mom yesterday, and she said, I had already asked her if I could use Sam's story, and she said, not only that, you can tell them everything about our story because we are so appreciative. Here's her quote. This was in a letter to us. We knew our little boy was in there. Treatment has changed our lives. Treatment didn't just change Sam's life. Treatment changed all of their lives and everybody they know. Sam now is talking, chasing his brother, playing much more appropriately. Sam still, still has autism, but his range of autism is less than half of what it was. So what can you do? Just be aware. Believe me when I tell you there are therapies out there that make a difference. Believe me when I tell you that parents usually know when there's a problem with their child or a concern. In whatever role you serve, parent, grandparent, uncle, aunt, Sunday school teacher, it makes no difference. When a parent says to you, I'm worried about my little one X, Y, Z, don't say, boys talk later. Oh, he was a motor skill kid, so he's probably not going to talk on time. Put all that stuff aside. Say, you need to talk to somebody. If you're worried, talk to somebody. And talk to somebody who knows. Encourage getting an evaluation from an expert. An expert can be a healthcare provider, can be an educator. But you need somebody who's deep in this area to understand it. And then encourage people getting the best treatments. Really, it's just like stroke. It's recognized, refer, and treat. I'm here to ask you to become an autism first responder. Thank you.